surely the most remarkable piece of paleomedia of the last two decades, and certainly the most acclaimed, is a dinosaur documentary. Prehistoric Planet, which has been showered with praise by all of us. What makes this documentary so special? How does it differ from those that came before? Now, I am going to answer that question, and it's not as simple as just dunking on Jurassic World by comparing animal behavior and accuracy that is low-hanging fruit. There's something so much more unique about it. Prehistoric Planet has photorealistic CGI provided by John Favreau's moving picture company. The scientific accuracy is as up-to-date as possible thanks to the input by paleontologists such as Steve Brusetti and Mark Witten. The cinematography is as beautiful as that of a big-budget BBC Planet Earth production. The voice of David Attenborough gives the narration its gravitas. The soundtrack by Hans Zimmer, Kara Talwe and Anse Rotzmann perfectly rounds out the experience. And yet, in my opinion, the single most important aspect is none of these, and to understand it, we have to travel back exactly 10 years. The year is 2012. Ever since Walking with Dinosaurs has brought CGI dinosaurs to the small screen in 1999, there has been at least one dinosaur documentary with CGI recreations per year. And with every new documentary, that original vision of depicting dinosaurs as animals in their natural habitat seems to have slipped further and further away in favor of focusing on just what effective killing machines dinosaurs are, reaching critical mass in the late 2000s and early 2010s with shows like Jurassic Fight Club, Monsters Resurrected and Clash of the Dinosaurs. It is the age of awesome bros. And so, three science communicators took matters into their own hands. Paleo artist John Conway, science fiction artist C.M. Koseman, most well known for his book All Tomorrows, and paleontologist Darren Nash, most well known for his blog Tetrapod Zoology, which has even spawned its own annual convention. See you then next weekend. Their book, All Yesterdays, Unique and Speculative Views of Dinosaurs and Other Prehistoric Animals, is trying to do exactly what it says on the cover. To show dinosaurs doing things which they usually are not depicted doing, but which are possible just based on how modern animals behave. One of those radical new depictions is a Tyrannosaurus. Sleeping. Think about how ubiquitous the stereotype of the roaring hunting theropod must have been at the time for a paleo artist to be like, have you ever thought about showing it doing nothing exciting? Allosaurus had never seen such bullshit before. The book has also become famous for the section where it reconstructs modern animals with the same awesome bro attitude used for so many dinosaurs. Keep in mind at that point in time Jurassic Park 3 was over a decade old and Jurassic World wasn't even announced yet. So the contemporary paleo media that all yesterdays was criticizing was less the Jurassic franchise and more those previously mentioned dinosaur documentaries. Fast forward almost a decade later and Darren Nash becomes a consultant on a big budget documentary backed by John Favreau and the BBC. The perfect chance to introduce the all yesterdays movement to a mainstream audience. Almost every single segment in Prehistoric Planet stems from this basic concept. Show a prehistoric animal doing something that has not been done before. I applauded it for being different! It broke new ground! That is also why there are a few segments which I really don't care for. Because those are things we have seen before in other documentaries. Tyrannosaurus having sex, Dromaeosaur Pax hunting larger ornithopods, or sauropods knocking down trees. But Prehistoric Planet knows you have seen a dinosaur documentary before and pretty much every segment manages to add some unique spin to it. Whether intended or not, it feels like a direct response to the tropes we have seen in other documentaries. I think it is genius that the very first episode is Coasts, which was even titled High Seas during development, aka the one place during the Mesozoic where you'd be least likely to find a non-avian dinosaur. Literally, the opening shot is a dinosaur everyone knows, Tyrannosaurus rex, doing something you usually don't see, swimming in deep ocean water. Unless you've seen Speckles the Tarbosaurus, I guess. However, this specific scenario of a marine reptile attacking a pteropod has actually been used in dinosaur media before, and they still managed to portray it in a completely new way. 
I love that the T-Rex takes a breath to actually look underwater, showing that he's clearly aware of the dangers that can lurk in the water. You could say he took a calculated risk, but man was he bad at math. I love that they point out that even in water, an adult T-Rex is still big enough to defend itself, so the Mosasaur has to go for the baby. I was waiting for the Ocean Man moment to happen and it just doesn't. The baby gets dragged down by a wave and that's it. There is no jumping out of the water, no spectacular breaching, nothing particularly cinematic. It's just an aquatic animal snatching something from the surface in the most natural way. And this is something not just Jurassic World, but also several documentaries just exaggerate for the sake of a cool shot. I love seeing a Tyrannosaurus interacting with a giant protostagid turtle, because it's something you never usually see, and it highlights just how huge these turtles actually are when you see a freaking Tyrannosaurus struggle to flip one over. They even show T-Rex parenthood in a new way. We have seen so many depictions of T-Rex as the super protective and vengeful mother, so it is refreshing that A, it's a T-Rex father, and B, he's actually kind of a dick, so the babies have to manage on their own. I think the fact that the most popular image of the father T-Rex was just promotional material is hilarious. And after this first segment, we are done with dinosaurs for this episode. So the rest of the running time is all about non-dinosaurian animals. Pterosaurs are usually just background animals in documentaries, but in prehistoric planet they're in almost every episode. To be honest, this diverse pterosaur colony is by far my favorite pterosaur segment. Because by the time I was finished with the entire series, I've become sick of other star kids. Obviously, the colony is reminiscent of a seabird colony, but since we know from fossils that pterosaur eggs were soft shelled and that they hatched with already well developed wings, the concept of a baby sea turtle run, but with baby pterosaurs, is completely plausible. Whenever other documentaries show large pterosaurs flying, they are always slowly soaring through the air. Meanwhile, prehistoric planet shows that not all pterosaurs fly the same by showing Barbary Dactylus dive bombing and dogfighting. The pterosaurs are probably the best example of this documentary being unapologetic about how weird some extinct animals look. Look how spindly their wing fingers look when they folded their membrane while standing on the ground. Look at the proportions of this taffy draco, that beak is larger than the entire rest of the animal. Look at the hands of this phosphato draco pointing outwards and backwards. Look how the Alcyone and Barbary Dactylus have no hands on their wings. Look how weirdly squashed this Quetzalcoatlus looks when it does something as natural as sleeping. Look how weird a Hatsugop the rigs looks when viewed directly from the front. Obviously, this extends to the other animals as well. The giant turtle is based on Archelon, so it has a weird hooked beak. The Dreadnoughtus titanosaurs have a massive neck and comparatively short legs. The Mononychus has an ear anatomy similar to a barn owl, so it gets a facial disc or feathers. The Triceratops baby is based on actual skulls, so it doesn't just look like a cutesy chibi version of a Triceratops. What are those? Ah. Those are Triceratops, Baloo. Those are Triceratops. The Ankylosaur is based on Arnodontosaurus, so it gets a really uniquely shaped tail club. And the Mosasaur is a lizard, so it has a forked tongue. Which, by the way, is a feature that Jurassic World did not give its Mosasaur because they thought it would make the animal look too much like a fantasy creature. Allosaurus has witnessed such unbelievable amounts of bullshit here, so he just fucking left. Lizards shed their skin, so a mosasaur somehow had to shed its skin too. So why not have it being cleaned by a swarm of fish and shrimp? I love seeing a mosasaur just roll over on its back and relaxing. This is the most unbothered, moisturized, happy, in his lane, focused, flourishing mosasaur I have ever seen. And then he gets Ocean Man himself. They even managed to make the Mosasaur rival fight unique because I don't think I have ever seen a depiction where marine reptiles didn't just bite and mutilate each other, but instead tried to win by the far smarter tactic of drowning their opponent. If you've ever seen an ammonite in a documentary, it was a background animal that only existed for a marine reptile to interact with it. In prehistoric planet, ammonites finally get their chance to shine. Literally. Modern cephalopods can do crazy stuff with their chromatophores, so again, completely plausible and not one ammonite snacking mosasaur in sight. Speaking of which, plesiosaurs. The long-necked plesiosaurs in books and documentaries only exist to get eaten by the cooler, big-headed marine reptiles. For the first time, 
we see plesiosaurs actually teaming up and fighting back. And as speculative as it might seem, it is based on a series of scientific deductions. We have a fossil of a pregnant plesiosaur with a very large fetus. Therefore, plesiosaurs only gave birth to a single baby that required a lot of time to grow. Therefore, plesiosaurs had to ensure the survival of the single baby into adulthood. Therefore, plesiosaurs probably had strong social bonds. And while everyone who has read a dinosaur book knows how ichthyosaur babies are born underwater tail first so they do not drown, prehistoric plants it reveals how that would work for plesiosaur babies considering their large size and that ridiculously long neck. Even the sound design is subverting expectations. In other documentaries, pterosaurs screech like hawks. But here they make deep booming calls. In other documentaries, Theropods roar like lions and elephants. But here they just hiss and grumble like crocodiles. In other documentaries, sauropods sing like whales. But these dreadnoughts hiss and grunt. While sauropod rival fights have been depicted in other documentaries before, prehistoric plants reinvents them just through one simple concept. Their elephant seals. Everything from the inflatable display sex to the thick necks to the grunting to the vicious biting to the herds of females watching is clearly inspired by elephant seal fights while still being plausible for a sauropod. By not just making them gentle giants, the titanosaurs in this documentary feel almost like physical gods. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> Now it's time to talk about the Velociraptor and I think it's genius that the very first shot we see of it has both its iconic sickle claw and its wing feathers in the frame. Basically spelling out that feathers are just as integral to a Velociraptor as its claws. And the Velociraptor design looks like an actual bird of prey. Even other dinosaur documentaries have struggled to depict raptors not looking like they're just scaly dinosaurs stuffed into gorilla costumes. And prehistoric planet showcase of how Velociraptors utilize their feathers is the single best lecture to shut up any Jurassic World fan complaining about feathered dinosaurs being stupid. So it would have looked very different from that scaly monster that we're familiar with. It would have been coated in lots and lots of feathers. The idea that dinosaurs like Velociraptor were fully feathered is no longer at all controversial. <laughs> A downy coat may soften their image as scaly reptilian killers, but in fact feathers would have made Velociraptors even more deadly. For an animal like Velociraptor, feathers would have helped to control movement, particularly when the animal was leaping, climbing or changing direction during a hunt. Feathers can also function as a kind of suit of armour, providing protection from the blows of prey as well as from collisions with the environment. Jumping off a cliff because you know your feathers are gonna cushion the impact is more badass than anything a scaly raptor in a Jurassic movie could ever do. And since real life Velociraptors are still treated as a joke by many people because of their small size, what better way to demonstrate how terrifying they would still be by showing them from the perspective of a small prey animal. Or even better, a small prey animal living in an environment where they'd expect to be safe from the raptors. Wow! We have seen depictions of tyrannosaurs hunting and killing stuff a billion times, so just like all yesterdays, here we see Tarbosaurus just loafing around. 
or a Tarbo service at the watering hole just drinking instead of hunting. We don't actually get to see a Tyrannosaur hunt until the 4th and 5th episode and at least those are done in unique environments like a snowy field and a forest during fall. They even managed to show pterosaur display in a new way. We have seen depictions of big crested males displaying to smaller females before but we have never seen sexual mimicry which is a real thing that exists in nature so it probably existed in some pterosaurs too. Also, despite his small size, the sneaky male clearly has the coloration of a male and not a female. So I am saying that large man knew exactly who he was hitting on, if you know what I mean. Have you ever seen a Quetzalcoatlus on the ground in a dense forest? Ever wondered how a Quetz would have to squat to lay its eggs? Have you ever seen Plesiosaurs in a murky river environment? Or Ankylosaurs hibernating in a cave? Or wait, what is this? Triceratops, ah, those Ornithomimids in dinosaur books are usually one of the most boring dinosaurs. They look like a blander version of an ostrich and all they do is run very fast and steal eggs. Prehistoric Planet gives them an actually unique design just by directly applying the shaggy feather coat of a modern emu complete with a little feather crest. Also here's a fun observation, in this entire segment about a dinosaur famous for running fast, not a single one is actually running at any point and instead of stealing eggs from other dinosaurs, they are stealing nesting material from each other. And yet, the Ornithomimus is not even people's favorite Ornithomimusaur from this show. Somebody won't tell me the world is gonna Dino Kyrus is an extremely weird looking dinosaur and while this is one segment that I wish was longer, I do understand how the best way to make such a bizarre animal look natural is to show it doing something as mundane as scratching its back and taking a shit. Forest fires are something we have seen in other dinosaur documentaries and those are always focusing on the catastrophic aspect of it. But instead, Prehistoric Planet shows how forest fires are a natural part of the ecosystem and how animals can even benefit from them. Whether it's by eating charcoal or literally controlling fire itself by handling a burning stick with their jaws. The Troodontid and Atrociraptor are my favorite depiction of dinosaur intelligence in any media ever. And again, it's something real life modern dinosaurs are actually capable of. You wouldn't expect an animal as large as a Triceratops to venture into a cave. And yet it's something more than elephants do. And the Pharisinosaurus segment might be the first time ever that someone acknowledged the possibility of honey producing bees during the Cretaceous. Now it's time for the true star of prehistoric planet, the Carnotaurus, probably even more beloved than the T-Rex. Here we see a dinosaur usually portrayed as a badass with devil horns doing a mating dance that looks so silly and has such whimsical music playing that some Jurassic World fans would probably consider it outright undignifying. But guess what? That's how animals are. Animals don't care if something looks silly to a human because a human's opinion is completely irrelevant for them. And since Abelisaurs had huge muscular shoulder girdles despite having stubby arms useless for grabbing or slashing anything, yeah, they must have used them for something like display or communication and they probably would have looked funny while doing it. Like so much of life, it all comes down to sex. This idea was even shown in the original All Yesterday's book, twice, because they knew it would be that popular. Do the Mario swing your arms from side to side, come on it's time to go, do the Mario. Obviously, prehistoric planet has not been without its criticisms. Sure, some segments could have benefited from being longer and maybe it would have been nice if the freshwater episode was more about animals actually living in the freshwater instead of showing terrestrial animals with freshwater somewhere in the background. And there definitely should have been way more supplementary material explaining the scientific thought process behind it all. I think the most important thing about any dinosaur nature documentary is that it needs to make it as clear as possible which parts are based on direct scientific evidence, which parts are based on inferred evidence and which parts are complete speculation. But when those most consistent criticisms are all technically just saying we want more, then I'd consider that a positive. Some people have called prehistoric planet the spiritual successor of walking with dinosaurs. 
and it kinda is and isn't dead. And I am actually glad it's not dead. When we all picture a modern dinosaur documentary, we literally just pitch walking with dinosaurs again, but with other animals and more updated science. We were all fools. As great as Walking with Dinosaurs is at depicting dinosaurs act like natural animals, its overarching structure where each episode moves forward in time and showcases a different stage in the age of dinosaurs, puts every animal into the perspective of evolutionary success and extinction. When we see the Placerius in the first episode, we are already told that these are the last of their kind and that they will soon be extinct. When the Ornithocyrus is driven away by Enantionifines, we are told that birds are going to outcompete the pterosaurs. The cooler Sucus and polar Allosaur are presented as the last relics of bygone success stories. And the entire final episode is basically talking about how miserable the life of the last dinosaurs on earth already was before the asteroid impact. This overarching narrative of rises and downfalls is much more prevalent in Walking with Beasts. And especially Walking with Monsters. In the latter I would actually say it's to the detriment of the documentary, with its whole our answer sisters versus the arthropods theme. The reason why I would say Prehistoric Planet captures dinosaurs as animals better than even walking with dinosaurs is because it lives in the moment. Despite being set at the end of the Cretaceous, there is not a single mention of any impending doom by an asteroid. Instead of ending with the most famous and most over depicted mass extinction in prehistory, the documentary instead just ends with a pterosaur flying into the sunset which is vague enough to be open to interpretation. Prehistoric Planet is not a story about animals overshadowed by extinction. For once, it's just a story about animals being animals. Rick, what is that that you've just posted to your YouTube channel? What Something. do you mean just? Wait, what do you mean just? Oh shit. Oh shit, wait, 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 this is not supposed to go live. This was not supposed to go live yet! <laughs> <laughs>